Okay, let's get started. Good evening, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, the Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival. <laughs> Paul, you've got me laughing already. And I'm delighted <laughs> to welcome you to this post-concert <laughs> question and answer session following another totally enjoyable performance of our all virtual festival. Tonight's performance, which featured our own Boston Early Music Festival vocal and chamber ensembles in a double bill of comic opera by Pergolese was recorded in November of 2014 in Boston's celebrated Jordan Hall at New England Conservatory of Music. What a pleasure it is to welcome four of the five members of our directorial team. As I said, I think that's one of our musical co-directors, Paul Odette and Stephen Stubbs. <laughs> Concertmaster, AKA our BEMP Orchestra Director, Robert Mealy, and our Dance Director, Melinda Sullivan, who also served as movement coach for tonight's performance. What a pleasure it is to welcome you all. Unfortunately, given the, the hour in Europe, uh, it being 4.15 a.m., uh, our stage director, Gilbert, will not be joining us, but he sends his good wishes and regards to all. I always like to remind our audience watching. If you're wishing to submit questions, please do so by typing your question into the Q&A. At the bottom of your, your screen, you'll see both a Q&A button and a chat button. And again, please enter your questions using the Q&A button. So I recall laughing out loud many times during our previous staged performances of these two delightful chamber operas. Seeing them again tonight up close and in the comfort of our TV room here at home had me laughing out loud again and again. And that, that felt really good. Of course, uh, those of us, of us who organized this all virtual festival had high hopes of providing a music filled week of solace and joy. And I think tonight you should all feel very proud and very satisfied for delivering such a beautifully performed and hysterical performance. Before we start accepting questions from the audience, I have a, a few of my own. I've been just so anxious to hear the four of you talk a little bit about now having seen this seven years later uh, and from the perspective of being an audience member, how did that feel for you? Um, did you, looking at it tonight, do you believe that you handled some of the challenges that you recall? dealing with at the time in a way that was satisfying and, and fulfilled your expectations? Um, maybe I'll start off. Sure. Uh, I, uh, I do remember that it was, um, it was very hard work uh, because it, comedy is in, in a sense more detail oriented than grand tragedy or other, other forms of theater. It really comes down to the exact timing of what we're doing musically, what the uh, singer actors are doing with physically and what the, the mime artists who are su such a brilliant part of this production are doing. So that the, the um, my memory of the rehearsal period was of extremely intense detailed work. And so it was such a pleasure at this distance of time to just see it as a fun show. I mean, it, it was just totally, like you said, laugh out loud, funny many times. I mean, I especially loved the moment when after um, Amanda had told Douglas her sob story of uh, and got, gotten him sort of worked up into a, a kind of crying fit. And as she started her most tender aria, he timed a blowing of the nose just perfectly so the you just couldn't help but laugh at that I, I love that sort of stuff the thing that is so challenging about this project is that because we're doing this without anybody waving their arms to conduct us we had to pick up beginnings and uh timed entrances sometimes with singers who were quite a few meters in front of us and on the other side of the stage. And as Steve said, the timing is so critical in, in comedy uh, like this. And of course, as a performer, you're hyper sensitive to any little moment that isn't 
perfectly timed or perfectly together, but watching it from the front, you don't really notice little things like that you get much more a sense of the of the total impact of the of the show and i can say it's much more enjoyable watching from the front as an audience member than watching the backs of the singers all night long <laughs> so that was definitely really for me tonight yeah it's definitely a huge challenge i mean this time at least um often we have the the singers really surrounding us this time we had a stage behind us so we could actually really see a lot of the action that's going on on the, on the miniature stage but then a lot of times um you know the singers would be doing these fabulous um maneuvers all around us and to the edges of the stage and catching the barest cues was sometimes just a a real challenge because Jordan Hall oddly enough it seems very intimate when you're looking at it but it really feels it's it's a big distance to 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 reach across psychically and to really get out those connections. But one of the nice things about um, feeling like we have such a company here is that we really can trust each other and we really can respond incredibly quickly to all these things going on. I, I was, oh, sorry. Go no, go ahead, Mother. I was I was so much more relaxed watching this than being in it. <laughs> Because uh, when we began, Jobert suggested, why don't he and I have a little cameo role? And to me, a cameo role means you come on one time with the chains to wrap around Jesse to, to arrest him, and then you go away. But it, for Gilbert and I, it turned into a whole part. And so behind that stage that was way upstage with the curtain, we were often behind counting and listening and passing props through the curtain or around the sides. And it had to be right at the moment because we couldn't see the actors on stage reaching their hand out to take a pitchfork or a crown or whatever. Uh, so it was a, it was um, intense and amazing and um, much more relaxing to be in the audience watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also forgotten just how fast everything happens. I mean. Our, what I one of the things I love about the show is that our tempos are really, really, really good. They're really, really tight. And um, I was kind of blown away sometimes that I was like, wow, that really was much faster than I remembered, actually. Yeah. Which is fantastic. I, I was going to say that uh, one of the things I was very aware of is the way uh, Pergolesi here in the 1730s, when uh, Bach and Handel are still in their prime doing their sort of, um, you know, high Baroque style he's totally pointing the way towards Mozart all the time. And in, in particular, in those, uh, those incredible accompanied recitatives, you know, the, the things where um, the orchestra in total, not just the continuo, but the entire orchestra responds to little uh, recited statements. And it has to be completely flexible. And I, I, was, I was thinking today that, you know, uh, it's, it's the test for every young conductor to do the Sprecher Szene from, from the Magic Flute, which is a, a similar situation, which is a, a call and response, you could say, between the, the stage and, and the orchestra. And it's just nerve wracking, a really blood curdling and hair graying experience for every conductor to try to get the orchestra to be together with a singer at, you know, at, at 60 paces and, and so on. And just the, the unanimity of intent between the orchestra and the singers here was just stunning. And as Paul said, with, without anybody waving their hands, and in fact, nobody could have effectively waved their hands at that. The, the, the whole point is we were responding spontaneously to one another. You know, I love to talk about what makes Benf unique. Pretty much everything we do is, is unique and, and that is so motivating, but I'm especially curious to know, and again, given the comic nature of these works, um, what happens in the rehearsal room, room when it comes to the, the musical interpretation and the staging, the evolution of the staging? How does one influence the other in the rehearsal room? Constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it, constant it, give and take, yeah. It, it is the process that that we have uh, developed at BEM for everything, even, even the, the tragedies. It's an essential collaboration that we get the singers and Gilbert, the stage director, 
and the choreographer and Steve and me, and when we get to the orchestral things, Robert, all in the room, talking about how we see each scene, literally phrase by phrase, and talk through it. And I think it's even more the case in comedy, because there are so many different ways you can play comedy. You can do the exact same four bars of music in many more different ways than you can when you're doing tragedy. So trying to understand how Gilbert sees that from a dramaturgical perspective, how the singers see their feelings at a given moment, how Steve and I think about the what is in the music and what the composer is trying to say by the way the music is, is written, the rhythms, the harmonies, the tessitura, the texture, all of these uh, things. It, it's a constant give and take. You could never do a project like this in the way that a lot of modern uh, opera companies work where uh, the stage director goes in and tells the singers what to do and the conductor comes in a couple of days before the opening and, and waves their, their baton because there's no way that you can be on the same page and there can be really a cohesive um, artistic result. You have to have everybody working together and um, uh, adding their own ideas so that the sum is greater than the parts. And that was a real joy with this production because everybody in the cast we had worked with, so they already knew how to work that way. And that just made, I don't think we could have done a comedy with four singers that we had never worked with before, or even if one of them was off, you know? Yes. Yeah, just I mean, an all-star team. I kept thinking that throughout the night. What a what a incredible company, Robert. I was laughing as I was as I was watching you. I mean, I'm always in amazement what you, what you can do. But just catching all the twists and the turns of the of the singers, do they do they change what they're doing from performance to performance or from rehearsal to performance to performance? I mean, you must always be on the edge of your seat. I think for all of us, I mean, there, there are a couple of moments that are really, um, just watching it just now, I remember the, the moment when Livietta's died and she keeps almost coming back to life and Jesse has to, and we have to catch him. And that that is super, super I just remember that being a real challenge mm -hmm. because there's almost no time for him to give a breath cue or anything, he just goes. So, so we're all just watching like hawks at that moment to catch it. A moment like that has to be dramatically unpredictable from the singer. You can't actually prepare for that for that movement. But the fact that there's no preparation means that for the orchestra, trying to pick that out of thin air with no indication when it's going to happen, that, that's the scary part and also really the exciting part. It's that kind of living on the edge, the spontaneity that, that makes this kind of a project so much fun. Melinda, um, we know that the libretti offer an abundance of slapstick opportunities, both for singers and actors, um, thanks to the repeated use of disguises by the characters. Did you have a favorite disguise? And <laughs> if so, if so why? Every time Carlos came on was my favorite part, but uh, I think Tempesta is really my favorite. He has lots of time to react to every situation and what everybody's saying and what's happening in the orchestra. So he finds every possible way to be mean or strong or fiery, uh, whatever uh, was happening in the libretto at the moment. He's so inventive. He did the same thick kind of ideas each time, but of course, every, every rehearsal every night was a little different, just as every moment is a little different. And uh, Caroline and Carlos were able to tap into that. I also love watching Caroline's, she, her, her character is a little more simple than Fulvia and she believes every moment that's happening, she doesn't understand <laughs> deceiving someone. So I, I love when she's mad at Jesse, but then Jesse starts singing in a loving way and she totally falls for it because that's what's happening at the moment. And then uh, she's told to snap out of it and she snaps back out of it. So I, I, I don't, 
I can, it's hard to pick a, a moment, but I just love watching these dancers or the pantomime mm -hmm. artists uh, believe every moment, truly believe the moment that's happening right now and connecting into that electricity we all had on stage together. Yeah, that's a great word, electricity. Here's a question from one of our tried and true fans. Um, Paul Stephen Robert, having seen these shows from the outside, is there anything you would do differently in future shows when you're back inside? I think we'll be just be so grateful to be back together. <laughs> yeah. Frankly. That's absolutely true. Now, I, it, it, it wasn't in any of the things we've seen this week, there wasn't anything I was thinking, oh, I would do that completely differently now. I just uh, would, you know, sort of ache for the chance to do it again. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I was certainly aware of the fact that Steve, you and I and Avi uh, and Phoebe were sitting much closer together. So it was much easier to play together than was the case for us in either the Handel program with Amanda or the Monteverdi where we were six feet apart and couldn't hear each other and were just guessing where to where to play notes. So the, the thing I'm most looking forward is to is being able to sit in close proximity so we can create that kind of cohesive ensemble feeling in the in the continuo and also with the strings i think the same thing right robert totally totally and i think i mean i, I think we're really looking forward to this was our first real um investigation into the whole uh intermezzo genre and i we're really looking forward to doing a lot more exploration of that i think it's a, a the, this kind of for one thing it's it's comedy is not something that we've necessarily done in the past we've you know usually done big tragedy kind of stuff but it's I mean, Gilbert is so great at it, and it's really super, super, super fun for all of us. So um, I'm really looking forward to more projects in this vein. Paul and Steve, a question for you. What do performers need to know about Pergolesi's style to bring the music to life? I think one of the things that jumps out at you when you look at the manuscripts um, is the amount of contrast that uh, is notated in a lot of the original sources. And alas, not in many modern editions, but they frequently write in enormous dynamic changes from three Fs to three Ps from one moment to the next. This isn't music that goes from mezzo piano to mezzo forte. It really goes all the way in razor sharp juxtapositions from one moment to the next. There are descriptions in Neapolitan manuscripts in recitatives about how the singers have to deliver the text in a sobbing way or in a weeping way or in a laughing way or shrieking or trembling. And you realize that this is not music that lives in moderation. It, it, is, it, uh, it lives on the extremes. And I think that Pergolesi is often uh, not done to its fullest potential because people tend to think of it as um, not quite Mozart and therefore kind of half baked. But once you really embrace the Neapolitan style, I think it springs to life as, as we saw tonight. And the other thing about it is that the, the recitatives, apart from the, the, the descriptions that we have, as Paul was saying about the, you know, the sobbing or laughing or whatever style, um, it's really that the, the singer actors need to possess the text just like actors who didn't have any kind of uh, musical guidance, you could say. So it's not at all fulfilling some preordained musical plan from Pergolesi. It's Pergolesi giving them the freedom to act in a, in a very naturalistic or comedia dell'arte style. And uh, I, I was just amazed to the extent to which our four soloists just took that ball and ran with it. I thought that was just wonderful. Here's a, a very touching, I would say it's a statement more than it is a question, but um, well worth sharing. 
This person notes, I thoroughly enjoyed the original performance, but an unexpected joy of watching virtually was seeing the orchestra reactions to what's happening on stage much more clearly. Tonight really brought home to me the theme of this week, Memphis of family and every member of each production is a respected partner. This collegiality with the high level of performance is such a gift to your audience. And that person is absolutely right. We have entirely genuine. The thing is, we feel that way about each other. We trust each other. We believe in each other. You feel like you hand the ball to another person. They're going to absolutely fulfill what you ask them to do. And that's what makes it such a joy to work with this group. It's nice to hear. Melinda, how about if you share your thoughts about how the players use the in-between music to support the action and the reactions and the jokes? Uh, well, maybe it connects to what um, Steve was saying about the orchestra having the music that responds to the singers and the movement people tend to move on when the orchestra is responding to what the singer um, has just said. Uh, I, I love so many moments like um, we used in between music when Carlos is handing the Kleenex off to Amanda when she's crying, singing her poor Serpina uh, aria. Uh, and Amanda's so amazing with her timing in comedy, uh, the way she took the Kleenex. But then Carlos, of course, because he believes every moment that's happening, gets so sad. He he takes the Kleenex and when the violins go, da, 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 he goes, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> <laughs> or he walks that way. Da, 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 da. So the, the, you're constantly listening for that as a dancer or a pantomime artist, the music that you can respond to and then timing. So you're not just going to get a wig and putting it on a stand. You're listening to the music that's telling you how exactly. and uh, ex describing the supporting the scene a little more by how you how you're getting the wig. Uh, that's the best part for um, the commedia players to, or there are dancers to play with. Constantly hearing, you know, starting with the continuo, so you get the underneath part, and then all the little winds and strings. One of the I things I loved so much about watching this was the, um, the, especially when the whole company's out front dancing on the stage, it it looks exactly like the cover of our, of our festival book. I mean, it really does look like these Neapolitan illustrations, it's exactly, it's, it's very, very, very cool to see that come to life. And it, it's always it's always striking to me that these uh, Pergolesi uh, themes and, and ways of treating music are so much like a lost soundtrack to, I don't know, a Marx Brothers movie or a Bugs Bunny movie. It's something that is, it, it's, it's like, you, you see what it's supposed to be, but it, it only comes to life when everybody's actually doing it. I saw Harpo Marx and Lucille Ball throughout that show. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> this individual, um, this is an interesting question. He says, I'm curious about the sound engineering. At home, I could hear every word sung so clearly. I know in live performances, you don't always hear everything so well. Would I have heard it this well if I had been in attendance? Did the taped production go through some processing to make the sound quality so good? I, I think that, that was the yeah, that was the magic of the of the mics at, at Jordan Hall, wasn't it, Kathy? That's there was no uh, post production. No, is that something yeah. you can capture in a recorded performance of a stage performance? because the microphones are closer to the singers than if you're sitting in the 20th row. You're obviously much further away. It's more difficult to project declaimed text, although we certainly work hard with, with all of our singers on making the declamation as, as vivid as possible. In fact, the mics were close enough to catch the bouquet when Caroline threw it at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say one of my favorite timing moments of all is 
the Gilbert's like deliberately late beat of throwing the confetti in the air too late, which I just I just love that so much. Yeah. 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 Well, that's one of those things that's different every night. So the moment uh, I was supposed to catch the bouquet that was thrown from the stage at the same moment that the petals came down. So but of course, the bouquet never came down because it got caught in the microphone <laughs> above. So then at the moment, you have to decide what how, what to do with that. And he waited for the perfect moment and then tossed the pep. <laughs> it was beautiful. One of my favorite moments, which I never saw when we were rehearsing, um, it was when Jesse is uh, trembling and he, he shakes with his, with his knees, but really with his whole legs. And he does it so quickly and so convincingly. Is there a technique for learning how to do that? That was really <laughs> virtuoso leg movements. I think you have to be supported in your torso as all singers are and released in your hips and knees. You should give it a try with that mask on, Paul. <laughs> I think that will help. <laughs> Good, Paul. Try it now. <laughs> um, just to uh, change the, the tone of this discussion a little bit, here's a slightly longer question, but a, an excellent one. Some historians believe that La Serva Padrona led to the French Revolution by making it acceptable to speak ill of aristocratic landowners. The opera demonstrated pro-revolutionary ideas as the question of class structure would be of great importance during the French Revolution later in the 18th century. La Serva Padrona allowed Pierre Beaumarchais to get away with performing The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro. These plays created an atmosphere in France that allowed people to criticize aristocrats. Do you agree with this notion? That, um, it, it was definitely true that when, when, this, when Serva came to Paris in 1752, um, it was used as cover for a way to critique the, the power structure. Um, and it was kind of a safe way to do that because you were talking about theater rather than directly talking about politics. I always find the irony of that production in Paris, which was so revolutionary, the 1752 one, was actually put on because the Paris Opera had run out of money because the King wasn't supporting it anymore. So they had to do a cheap show. So they brought in Serva because it just takes a tiny band and, and two singers. So ironically enough, that was why, that was why it was on stage. Interesting. I mean, opera and, and politics have been bound up from the beginning without any question. And in France, it's, it's, it couldn't be clearer than the fact that, that Lully's Tragédie Lyrique, one year after another, served the exact purposes of Louis XIV as he needed them. And he was, he was basically being personified as these various mythical uh, beings to, to do what he needed done. So the, the, the fact that the, the French were used to having their uh, patrimony served up like that, uh, probably it was kind of a revolutionary uh, thing when they saw it being criticized from the stage as well. La Serva Padrona received no less than two dozen separate productions in the decade after Pergolesi's death throughout Italy and Germany. Why was it so popular? I think we saw that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good show. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, there were a lot of these intermezzi that were composed throughout Italy from the very beginnings of the, of the 18th century. In, in fact, one of them, an intermezzo by Orlandini, was the single most often revived um, theater piece, music or spoken drama in the 18th century. It had an astounding number of, of performances uh, all over Europe, and yet it has kind of disappeared. It's a very good piece. I think Serva Padrona just is so beautifully uh, written both the libretto and and the music, it's so well balanced that I I think it it strikes a responsive chord in in people. Sure. 
I have a question for you. Um, as, as you well know, in January of 2022, we plan to record this double bill in Germany for CPO, where we've made 11 of our 13 or 13 of our 14, I think, recordings to date. Over the years, we've developed this pattern of rehearsing and performing these chamber operas annually in Boston over Thanksgiving weekend. And then we subsequently tour them and revive them at festivals and so on and so forth. Um, this has become a, a critical part of the trajectory of these projects and certainly um, helps justify the initial investment. A final stop along this journey or a stop along this journey are these recordings that we've had such success with. I'm curious to know how you will approach these pieces in the recording studio without what to me seemed like essential, you know, stage elements tonight, humor, just a critical role. How do you, how do you pull that off in a recording? Yeah. I think it's with all of the singers um, watching the video and reminding themselves of exactly what they were doing and, and trying to recreate those feelings. Obviously they're not going to be running around. They have to be in place, but at least understanding the context and therefore the, the, the feeling that they have to have at any given moment. I feel like one essential ingredient is that we have to have some sound effects. This has to be a little bit more like a radio play than you would do if you were performing, if recording a Handel opera. For instance, some of the slaps and some of the the sighs and and some of those kinds of of sound effects. I don't know who's going to do Captain Stormy's um, uh, sound effects, but I think some of those things really have to be part of it because to not include that would be to miss out an important dramatic stroke comic element. And we've been very lucky with our partnership with the uh, uh, the people at Radio Bremen in, in, in Bremen, where we do our recordings, because they were all deeply experienced in exactly that, in doing radio plays. And so they know all about making a, a, a radio play come to life uh, just by sound. And so they've been very helpful to us in making our things come to life in that way. Even something like a door slamming or, yeah, that kind of thing. I think that'll be an important ingredient. What, what I think will be an unusual feeling for us is that because in this staging, um, Gilbert interlaced the two pieces. So we would have, a, a, you heard tonight and saw a scene from Serva Padrona followed by the opening scene of Liviete Tracolo, followed by the second scene of Serva Padrona. And obviously we're not going to do that for a recording. I think a recording has to represent each piece um, uh, true to its character and structure and, and, and concept. So that'll be a slightly different feeling because doing them in a different sequence as we did, you start a new scene with a slightly different feeling than you might coming out of the previous scene of, of that particular intermezzo. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a nice segue to another question, a question that's actually been asked a lot this week now that we're showing off some of our archival videos starting out the week with the Campra and tonight. Um, why not? Why not make a DVD of this of this double bill? I mean, just to, to speak to the, <laughs> I know. I think I think it's actually a question for me. I think I should probably take a shot at that one. De Niro, right? I need to, I need to get Jesse to uh, to help me raise money. But that's that's really. I mean, it's worth thinking about because we haven't yet made a commercially available DVD. We've been talking about it and. I mean, between what I've seen this week and what we've all experienced, it's just, it's the next step for us. So we have to figure out how to do it. So to the person who has asked, when are we gonna be releasing a DVD? Hang on to that thought, we'll, we'll work on it. The challenge with that is that it's, it, 
it would be a lot easier to make a DVD of a project that we're already rehearsing and performing right. to go back to 2014 and try to recreate that production that you saw tonight would require a similar amount of rehearsal time, which is to say nine hours a day for two weeks solid in order to get it up to the level we would want to get it to. One person asks if the musicians can speak to how the audience reaction in past performances and lack of audience in the COVID era has changed your experience. We miss them. <laughs> we miss each other. I have to say that in the last 15 months, the the solo recitals that I've given uh, either playing into my computer or in a church with a videographer have have been very difficult because I perform very much with the energy that's in the room, the response of the audience, the fact that I'm doing something live in front of people and trying to communicate with them is such a vital part of what I do. And when that isn't there, when I'm just playing in a dead room, I find it very hard to really get emotionally up for doing what I'm what I'm trying to do. And I, think, uh, yeah. I look forward in two weeks to playing my first live solo concert again in in Spain and experiencing that energy and immediacy of having the the audience there. We just started playing live concerts at Juilliard on the um, these stages at Lincoln Center and what it, what it really brought home for me was one of the most difficult one of the cha real challenges of this year has been that um, with a video production as satisfying as the music making can be there's no moment of finality about it there's no like you've done it, but then you have to edit it and then you have to re-edit it. And there may be like this week, an actual moment where there is a, a, a an event where you can actually witness it, but often it, it trails on and on and on. And I was so, I had just really forgotten how the, the fantastic energy of doing the concert and it's done and it was great and hooray. And that, that's that been very, It's we're really looking forward to getting back to that, I have to say. And as an audience member, I mean, you know, we miss, we miss it too. That desire to stand up and applaud and scream and stamp your feet. I mean, I, I was doing that myself in the TV room tonight as I watched this, but I, but I miss that. I'm looking forward to getting back to that. Another comment by a wonderful fan, simply who reminds you that I loved the byplay with the orchestra, particularly the theft of keys from the wind player and the money from the harpsichordist's wallet. That, that was hysterical. Did that happen exactly the same way in, in all performances? The harpsichordist made his own Lotzi joke there. <laughs> and when we're talking about the singers and dancers and musicians all being on the same electric wire, it's like that with the whole orchestra. So. Actually, Gonzalo always had his phone on the floor right by his chair. And we said, let's steal his phone and see if he notices. <laughs> and then we put it into the show. But Avi came up with his own joke and attached a string because we said, okay, is it okay if we steal your wallet? He said, sure. But then he played the joke on <laughs> Jesse. And every day in rehearsal, it was a different object that came out of his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one performance uh, that we did, Jesse, because he calls himself Sopresata um, in the beginning of Liviette Tracollo, after he mishears Livietta giving her name, um, where she doesn't give her name, but she says plusieurs nom, plusieurs nom in French, and he thinks that me that's prosciutto and that's a funny name, so he calls himself soppressata. And I arrived at my chair one evening, and there was a big soppressata salami uh, lying right next to my <laughs> lute. So when I picked up my lute, there was a salami next to it. <laughs> that's great. Well. This 
dear friend of ours um, says simply, thank you for the fantastic productions the Bent family brings to us year after year. You transport us into times where aesthetics, beauty, and music were paramount in lifting the human spirit and lifting in the process our own. Profound respect and thanks, very nice. How are we doing on questions? I have one more. One more, okay. And then I, I just wanna touch a little bit on this coming November, 2021, when we will be together again. Good? Okay. So here's a question. Do we have any accounts of how intermezzi were rehearsed in the 18th century? Can we speculate that how they prepared was similar, different, or both from how you prepared and how long you had to do it? I don't know of any detailed accounts of how the intermezzi in particular were, were rehearsed. Of course, the singers were different singers from the ones who were singing in the opera seria that the intermezzi were performed between the acts of. So those singers who have just sung act one of a tragedy, they go off and, and have a drink and relax and maybe change costumes. The commedia people were a separate troupe who came in. And there are some accounts that say that the orchestra was often a reduced orchestra. So you could also send most of the orchestra to the pub for the intermission and just a, a group like what we had uh, in this evening's performance would would do the, the commedia. Um, but exactly how and when they rehearsed and for how long, uh, I, we don't really have any information. One piece of information we do have is how the recitatives were rehearsed in general in the 18th century, um, because sometimes composers would compose the arias and they didn't get around to writing the music for the recitatives of the last act. And uh, in, in one case, Yomelli, who was a contemporary of, of Pergolesi's in, uh, in Naples, sent a note back to the, to the singers saying, don't worry, I promise I'll get the notes to the recitatives of the last act at least a few days before opening night. Just continue rehearsing in the normal way. And the normal way is that they would have recited or declaimed the text with, without music. So they already knew the text from memory and how they wanted to inflect and how they wanted to deliver it. And then it was just a question of seeing what the what the notes were and the harmonies that the composer provided. The, the reason we know that story, which is it, it's so fantastic to know, is that Yomeli was, uh, after Pergolesi, the, probably the, the most famous and important composer of opera at the time. He was at Stuttgart and the Stuttgart court blew up and uh, he, he decided he wanted to live in his native Naples and live the life of Riley in Naples. But he accepted a, a, um, a commission from uh, Lisbon, from Portugal. And for years, he sent his operas to Lisbon. So it was on boat traffic back and forth. And there was this urgent message to him about a week and a half before opening night saying, Maestro, we don't have the third act yet. And, he's, and he writes back, just tell them to rehearse in the normal way. It'll it'll be there on time. Don't worry. <laughs> oh. And of course, having a troupe of the the two singers in any comic intermezzo who were native speakers, they could probably have even improvised a, a lot of the 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 text. Yeah. So just to look ahead, this coming November. 2021, as we've advertised in our in our beautiful program book to go along with this week, we plan to produce another double bill of comic opera, this, by, this time by two German composers, Telemann's Pimpinone and Hasse's La Finta Tedesca. Without giving an, away any of Gilbert's secrets or staging ideas, um, can you tell us a little bit more about these pieces and why you have chosen to pair them together? 
Well, saying that they're German composers makes you think that my, it might all be in German and very uh, Germanic. But in fact, Hasse, next to Pergolesi, was one of the founders, you could say, of this style in Naples. He was, a, as a young composer, he was in Naples. And so we're, we're doing one of his Neapolitan, uh, you know, intermezzi, paired with Telemann's Pimpinone, which is, in fact, in German and written for Hamburg, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, it'll be kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's, it's basically this whole style coming across the Alps and making inroads into the rest of Europe, as, as I think Robert referred to before, the Serba Padrona made this enormous effect on, on Paris when it arrived there. But that, that effect was, was widespread. Everybody accepted this new style with open arms because it was so unique and so entertaining. And also in particular is um, kind of wonderful in that it involves uh, Virtuoso turns from some of the soloists. You have to, the um, the female character has to be has to speak fake German, has to speak um, has to be a doctor, has to be a mad woman, um, and has to speak in a very thick Bolognese accent. So it will be a linguistic tour de force. <laughs> and that particular piece was also revived in other places in Italy, it was revived in Germany, which is amazing to think about how the German audience would have received, of course, they would have enjoyed an Italian singing in fake German. But the second act where she speaks as a, as a lawyer from Bologna, speaking in Bolognese dialect, one wonders what the German audiences made of that or whether they just followed in their little, we have the translation from the Potsdam production of 1746 with the side-by-side -side, um, Bolognese original and the German 18th century translation of that. But it, uh, Paul, you, you'll remember our friend Eleonora Fuser, the Comédie dell'arte actress from Venice. And I've, I've watched her perform for English speaking and German speaking and Swedish speaking audiences. And she's speaking Italian the whole time, sometimes in dialects and so on. But just by uh, the su mere suggestion of one word from the language of the people, she makes you believe you're understanding what she's saying and the, the, all the, all the uh, things that they have for special effects like rubber chickens and so on uh, adds to the effect that you, you believe you're understanding exactly what she's saying. You don't understand a word, but you don't really have to. <laughs> That's also true in Italy, by the way. I went to a Commedia production a couple of years ago uh, in, in Italy, and um, some of the dialects were so wild, I would only catch occasional words. And I was talking to Italian friends afterwards, and I said, did you understand the person who was speaking Bergamasca? And they said, no, not a syllable. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny because of the singing and the acting and, uh, and, and the rest of it. Yeah. Well, we should probably think about wrapping up as much as I could enjoy listening to all of you for hours. Before we go, Melinda, Robert, Steve, Paul, is there anything else about these pieces you wanted to share? I feel like between the pre-concert talk and this session and the informative program book, We've done a pretty good job, but um, have we left anything out that we that you need to be sure to tell us before we go to bed tonight? Just forget all of that and have fun. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I'm and I'm thrilled that we'll get to be recording this, frankly, because um, especially with Serva, there's a lot of not so fun recordings out there, and it'll be really nice to have a really fun recording. Yeah. Well, and all it takes is a bunch of not fun recordings and not fun performances that even serious scholars will say, oh, I'm not interested in Pergolesi, it's very dreary music. And no, that's, that's wrong. There are a lot of dreary performances. The music, as I hope people experienced this evening, is anything but dreary. It's absolutely brimming with um, color and... Um, vitality and expressive moments and hilarious moments and it, it's sheer genius you just have to get inside the music to understand what makes it tick 
So I agree, Robert, I can't wait to record this. Well, as I said, when I opened, our goal this week was to bring smiles to faces and to celebrate beautiful music, not necessarily together, literally, but certainly in spirit, virtually. And I think, um, I think you've all done a marvelous job. We've all done a marvelous job. It's been a great week. We have one more day tomorrow. But as I've said, this beautiful comic celebration tonight is available through July 11th. So tell your friends to watch it, purchase a ticket if they haven't yet and, um, and smile. Thanks to all of you. And we'll see you again tomorrow. And again, very soon in person. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.